What's up, everybody? I'm the Gojiru Philosopher, and today I want to take a look at something that came to me in a comment on one of my very first videos on this channel, and also seems to pop up every now and then whenever I have online discussions of Gojiru either in the comment section or on other places. Us Goju practitioners seem to make a huge deal about the distinction between Goju that comes from Okinawa and Goju that comes from Japan. As the Western karate community has been aware of for some time now, all karate has its origins in the fighting traditions that come from the Ryukyu kingdoms, and particularly those that come from its main island of Okinawa, from which modern Okinawa prefecture takes its name. While Okinawa may be a part of Japan now, for most of its history it was an independent kingdom with a tributary relationship to China and a complex network of trade connectivity between China, Japan, Korea, and the rest of continental Asia. However, during the Meiji Restoration, Japan asserted its control over Okinawa, using an incident where 54 Okinawans were killed after being stranded on Taiwan as a pretext for expanding conflict and eventually the detachment of a military troop to Taiwan in 1874. Ryukyu became the last official domain in Japan in 1872, before it transitioned into a prefecture in 1879 with the forced abdication of the last Ryukyuan king, Shoutai. However, since most of karate's development as a fighting system, took place in the 1850s or even earlier by some accounts, it bore very little real resemblance to the Japanese martial arts against which it's made a name for itself. While there is some evidence for the cross-pollination of Chinese influence on Okinawan karate and certain Japanese jiu-jitsu styles, such as Kitoryu or the Koryu jiu-jitsu styles that are referred to as Hakuda, meaning white hand, and many karateka were also definitely influenced by studying Jigenryu, a style of kenjutsu, by and large, Karate has a completely unique heritage when compared to Japanese martial arts. Karate didn't become a widespread part of mainland Japanese culture until the 1920s, although it was briefly considered for addition to Japanese army basic training before it was determined that it took too long to become proficient. By the time Itosu Anko and Funakoshi Gichin, as well as Miyagi Chojun and his contemporaries, had begun to gain traction in the mainland, Kano Jigoro's judo style had already had its famous challenges against other jiu-jitsu styles, and had all but secured the position of the primary unarmed combat sport of Taisho Japan. While the Kodokan does teach atemiwaza, striking techniques which are similar to those found in many styles of karate, the competitive rules of Kodokan judo favored nagewaza and katamewaza, throws and pins respectively, meaning that judoka no longer primarily focused on striking as part of their training. During the Meiji and Taisho periods, Japan was asserting itself on the world stage, and to that effect, it needed to convince the chauvinistic imperial powers of Britain, America, and France that it was capable of being a modern nation just like they were. This is why the concept of Bushido, the way of the samurai, was codified as the Japanese equivalent to feudal European concepts of chivalry. Fukuzawa Yukichi wrote his essay on leaving Asia and argued for Western education standards, and the newly restored imperial government fought and won the Sino-Japanese and Russo-Japanese wars, cementing their status as an imperial military force to be reckoned with. But many politicians and diet members were focused on building still more similarities to the West, including in the martial arts. Sumo and Judo were both similar enough to wrestling, and Kendo could take its place as the Japanese analog to fencing, but the Japanese government was missing a comparable sport to pugilism the sweet science, fisticuffs, the quintessentially civilized sport of boxing. And seeing this, the Japanese rushed to fill that void using the new striking techniques from their southernmost prefecture, namely karate. This is the historical point where Japanese karate began to emerge as a separate entity from Okinawan karate. The mainland Japanese began promoting the style that they had derided as rough and brutish, as being their new pride and joy, and of course, they began to fit it within the frames of Budo and Bushido, as well as competition. In fact, they never stopped, promoting it all the way to the Tokyo Olympics next summer, provided that the pandemic goes away. But you know me. I'm here to focus on Goju Ryu specifically, not all of karate. So we're going to be taking a look at how Goju specifically changed during this transition from Okinawan to Japanese where the differences are between Japanese goju and Okinawan goju, and most importantly, which of these styles is the better fighting system. Let's get into it. 
Obviously, if we want to talk about Goju Ryu in Japan, we first have to acknowledge that Goju was one of the first officially named Ryuha in the Dai Nippon Butoku Kai. Goju Ryu was officially named in 1933, although Miyagi was often unenthusiastic about separating his lineage from his contemporaries in other styles. Nevertheless, his lineage of karate was one of the first styles to be recognized by the Japanese government, and he served as the Okinawan representative of the Butoku Kai for several years. However, Japanese Goju Ryu actually has its roots several years before the style was even officially named, with one Yogi Jitsue. Yogi was a Naha-born martial artist who became Miyagi Chojun's student in 1928 or 1929, before matriculating into the Ritsumeikan University in Kyoto. While he was there, he met one Yamaguchi Jitsumi, who he would later befriend and teach. Yogi may have introduced Yamaguchi to Miyagi in 1931, although there's little evidence that this consisted of anything more than a letter of recommendation, and may have also hosted Miyagi during a brief mainland visit in 1933. Together, Yogi and Yamaguchi founded the Ritsumeikan University Karate Research Society in 1934, and would finally receive an official visit from Miyagi in 1935 and again in 1936. This was when Yamaguchi was famously given the moniker Gogen, meaning rough, which uses the first character of Goju as its first character. While it has been theorized that this name may have been a snide comment on Yamaguchi's lack of refinement, he liked the name enough to go by it for the rest of his life, and even to carry on the tradition of using the character Go in the names of his children as part of their symbolic name. These karateka would later go on to jointly found the Goju Kai in 1950. This organization would serve as the center of Goju Ryu in mainland Japan, especially since Miyagi's death in 1953 left the Okinawan side of his lineage without a proper successor to lead the push of Goju into Japan. However, this organization was restructured in 1972, elevating Yamaguchi to president, and with Yogi and one So Nechu, a Zainichi Korean whose influence helped to keep Yamaguchi's club alive during his stationing in Manchukuo, as the vice presidents. Yamaguchi eventually broke with Yogi and other Okinawan Goju Ryu proponents in 1973, splitting the Japanese Goju community. Yogi would go on to be one of Higan Amorio's supporters as successor when he founded the IOGKF in 1979. These two organizations, the Goju Kai and the IOGKF, would go on to become the predominant strains of Japanese Goju through to this day, although Higaona Sensei has since moved the IOGKF's Hombu Dojo back to Naha, and his Okinawan teacher Miyazato Eiichi has since passed away. Following this split, Yamaguchi's organization, the Goju Kai that comes to mind when you say Japanese Goju, had very little contact with Okinawan karateka, completing the divergence between Japanese and Okinawan Goju. Alright, so now that we know the historical point where Japanese and Okinawan Goju diverged, it's time to see where the biggest differences in their practice lie. And the first, of course, and most obvious, is going to be their focus on sports. So let's take a look at the way that sparring specifically works in Japanese Goju. It's important to remember that sparring and partner drills have always been a part of Goju Ryu since before it was even called that. Higa Onokanryo would frequently have his students, Miyagi, Kyoda, and Higa, spar and drill with each other. However, the modern form of kumite that we know today wasn't invented until karate became properly Japanese. While it's not clear who was the originator of the exact style of sparring that the WKF has made famous today, it bears a lot of similarity to the point sparring formats that were developed by Yamaguchi. In his childhood, Yamaguchi, like most other Japanese boys, had practiced kendo, and he modeled his karate sparring rules specifically off of kendo matches. While kendo is practiced with shinai, bamboo practice swords that are designed to cause minimal lasting injury, the competitive format of kendo rules is based on the assumption that these are supposed to be directly standing in for live blades. The allowable targets, the men, the head, the do, the body, and the kote, the wrists, are all places where if you were cut by a sword, you would either die, or specifically in the case of the wrists, you would probably become unable to hold your weapon, meaning that you would be killed on the next stroke. However, each strike is scored when it touches, since with a sharp sword, you don't really need to project a lot of force when you hit someone in order to injure or even kill them. However, when Yamaguchi applied this first blood style of scoring to karate kumite, something may have been a little bit lost in translation. The fist is, forgive me for saying it this way, a rather blunt instrument, as is your foot or your shin, and being touched by an opponent's attack does not necessarily guarantee that you'll be injured, 
let alone that you will be unable to continue to fight. Depending on the strength of the punch, the size of the attacker and of the defender, how far the attacker projects the force through their strike, and how the defender moves their body, a strike can land but do anywhere from massive damage to really no damage at all. However, because of Yamaguchi's legacy, Japanese Gojiryu schools will often include point sparring where the score is based on first touch, as opposed to whether the strike was effective. Nowadays, given how far the WKF's rule set has spread, it would be unwise to say that Okinawan Goju doesn't do point sparring, but it would be fair to say that it's given a lot less importance and weight in training. In fact, many Okinawan Goju schools teach their students how to take a punch, usually by covering how to harden one's muscles at the point of impact, as well as how to move or guard, or sometimes both, in order to minimize the amount of damage that a strike would be able to do. The goal of each strike might be to end a fight with a single blow, but if it's guarded properly, even a blow that technically lands will not be enough to end a fight on its own. Both Okinawan and Japanese Gojiryu practitioners spar with protectors, but Miyagi Chojun sensei outlined his goals for protectors, since he was attempting to develop a set of protectors before his death, as allowing people to practice sparring with more contact regularly without receiving lasting injuries. Meanwhile, Japanese goju sparring generally requires punches to be pulled with something called sundome, meaning stopping an inch away, especially when it comes to head punches, which is a trend that's shared by WKF Kumite. This focus affects how these practitioners practice their guards, which is why you'll occasionally see fighters in karate combat or other full contact promotions, who have spent most of their career fighting in WKF Kumite rules, get KO'd by headshots that an Okinawan karateka would have either slipped or guarded. Besides sparring, the other clear difference between Japanese goju and Okinawan goju is how they perform their techniques, especially in the kata and in their stances. Neither Yamaguchi nor Yogi had the opportunity to study with Miyagi for very long, and given that Miyagi's pre-war style of instruction was reportedly to teach his students sanchin, tensho, and then one other kata that he felt suited their body type, it's unlikely that either of them ever learned the full kata syllabus directly from Miyagi-sensei. In fact, it's well known that Yamaguchi trained with some of Miyagi's other students, most notably Yagi Meitoku, who may have even been the ones who taught him most of his kata. However, the problems arise from the fact that neither Yamaguchi nor Yogi had the opportunity to spend years and years polishing their kata and their technique before beginning to teach or before they founded the Goju Kai. In the modern Goju Kai, Yamaguchi's sons have introduced some teachings from other styles, making their kata look much more like other Okinawan goju lineages, but they still tend to have larger movements and lower stances than Okinawan lineages, and those stances still tend to look a lot more static and rigid. This is both a result of the lineage having focused primarily on the appearance of kata, due to their unfortunate inability to spend as much time learning as in-depth as Okinawan teachers, as well as it is due to the influence of Japanese martial arts, some of which place a heavy focus on very precisely executed movements. These features and movements translate much better to a competitive performance, since they're large enough to where judges can see them at a distance, but they have been criticized by Okinawan goju practitioners on occasion. And of course, finally, maybe the least significant difference between Japanese and Okinawan goju, but an interesting one nonetheless, is that the Japanese love to say us, whereas the Okinawans really do not. Us is a very masculine type of Japanese slang that you'll hear all the time in Japanese dojos, and not just Goju Ryu, but Shotokan and Kyokushin as well. You'll even sometimes hear it in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Okinawan Goju practitioners, on the other hand, tend to find this a little bit rude and prefer Damate Keiko, shut up and train. Thanks so much for listening to me tell you the historical and modern differences between Japanese and Okinawan Goju. I promised you that I would bring down judgment on which one is better, so here it is. Whichever one best suits your goals. I know that's a cop-out answer, and frankly speaking, I personally prefer Okinawan Goju, but honestly, maybe that's because I'm not really that skilled at WKF-style kumite. <laughs> In any case, though, if you liked this video, there's a button that you can press that will let me know that, and right next to it, there's a little box where you can tell me which style of goju you prefer, or if you found a combination of their different aspects is more up your alley. And while I'm doing all of these calls to action, if you'd like to see more of these kinds of breakdowns, or learn about different ideas and substyles within Goju Ryu, then you can subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications so that you see these videos as I upload them. I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and Damate Keiko! Difference between Okinawan and Japanese Goju, 
is that one of them sucks and then the other one's okay. Here we go, let's put this in front of the stack. That's how I make it look like I've been actually reading things. I did way too much fucking background on this.